The story begins somewhere shy of the summer of love. My brother and I were eight and nine years old and our favorite magazine was Monster Magazine. And this month in Monster Magazine, we discovered that you could buy a monkey in the back of Monster Magazine. Not a, not a stuffed monkey, not a sea monkey, but an actual squirrel monkey, 1995. So my brother and I decided this is the best idea we have ever had in our entire life. If we get a monkey and we take him to school, then everybody at school will love us. The teacher will love us because now she can talk about primates and she can bring science into class. The kids will all love us. The monkey will do chores for us. And so we decided this is like the best idea we've ever had. But we know that anything that we ask my mother for in advance, there's but one answer. No. So we decide that we will order the monkey and not tell her because when the monkey comes, she will love the monkey as much as we do. And we put $19.95 in an envelope and we mail it off. Now, his name will be Pepe. So we send that off and we, we wait. Weeks go by. And every day we wait and we look at the postman. We have hopes that he will have the box with him, but every day he does not. And then this is in the mid 60s. Women had round robin bridge tournaments in the basement for the country club ladies. And this was such a day. Whenever the country club ladies came over, we were in plaid jackets, red bow ties. Our hair was kind of slicked down. And we were sitting there trying to be good because the cardinal rule in our house was never under any circumstances do you ever embarrass your mother in front of the bridge club. So overcome the bridge club and they're there. We're sitting there very, very straight, getting this all through. When there is a knock at the door and it's the postman and he's got a box with our name on it. So my mom said, oh, for God's sakes, it's not coming in my house. Take that box back where you got it from. I don't want it here. Don't open the box. Don't bring it in. I don't care what the boys have ordered. And the postman says, if I take it back, now, we're about to have a full-scale meltdown because she's killing our monkey. And so we're about to have a complete meltdown in front of the bridge club. So my mother is sensing imminent disaster in front of the bridge club. Says, oh, you know, all right, fine, fine, fine. Put the monkey on the kitchen table. Now your father's at the hardware store. Under no circumstances are you to touch that box till he gets home. And when the bridge club is gone and your father's return, we will deal with this monkey issue. But until then, you don't go in that kitchen, you don't touch that box, you don't look in the kitchen, you don't smell the kitchen. You just stay out of there until this is over. I'm going down to finish my bridge tournament. And downstairs she went. Now we are eight and nine. There is no force in the universe that is going to stop us from getting in that kitchen. We have a monkey in the box in the kitchen. So we know, being eight, nine, where all the squeaking floorboards are. So we take off our shoes and we tiptoe all around the squeaking floorboards to get into the kitchen where Pepe awaits us. Now at this point, we know he's in there and he's scruffly in there. We go, oh my God, he's, he's suffocating. He's suffocating inside that box. So we see there's a little frayed corner and we think, if we help the frayed corner, then it'll look like Pepe's clawed his way to freedom. So it won't be our fault. So we get a steak knife and we kind of mangle it a little bit, a little hand pops out. <sighs> out pops Pepe. Monkeys are very, very smart creatures. They never defecate in enclosed places. He's been waiting a long time. And he goes screeching around the living room at the top of his lungs. And in front of him is a large arc of urine and behind him, this huge kind of Kiki's trail of defecation. So now, the women downstairs hear the screeching and run upstairs like, oh my God, oh my God. So they run up and they have huge beehives. That was the look back in the late 60s. They sprayed huge beehives. As they run up screaming, the monkey decides at this moment that the best defense is a strong offense and jumps on one of the ladies. And his wrist becomes entangled in her sprayed hair. So now his wrist is gone. Now he's screeching and biting the lady who's literally bleeding. And it's at this moment, all the women are screaming, that my father comes back in from the hardware store. And when he left, he had two beautiful children in a bridge club in the basement playing bridge, and he's a mild-mannered accountant from the suburbs. And now, in his mind, there's a rabid squirrel attack. He doesn't know what this thing is. And he runs, and he runs downstairs, and he gets these big leather garden gloves, and he traps the monkey behind the and he finally comes and grabs the monkey. 
because the monkey's biting everything that's there. He's trying to hold it, biting. Horrible needle like me. So we go outside. My sister's crib is on the front lawn, and we have a big screen door we put on top of the crib, and we put Pepe inside this, this screen enclosure. We put bricks on top of the door. <sighs> and all eyes then turn to my brother and I. The fear of God is being put into us, and as they're about to come down, it's like, what have you done to our house? My aunt, who's visiting from Florida, says, well, you know, look how sweet the monkey is. And the boys were stabbing at him, and he was shipped in a cardboard coffin. I mean, but the poor little monkey, look how sweet he is. He just needs some love. I've never pet a monkey. So she decides to put her arm in to pet the monkey. But where an arm can go in, a monkey can come out. And believing that he's in monkey Auschwitz, grabs hold of the nearest thing in front of him to attack, and that is her pendulous breast. And he grabs hold as hard as he can, and his head is shaking, he's grabbing, and she's screeching at the top of the lungs now, and she can't swat him off, and he won't get off, and she runs around the front yard, and the neighbors come out. And finally, she swats back out. She runs into the woods behind our house. Months go by. And we would go out every day and we would leave bananas out in the forest for him. And we would always be sure we just saw his, his tail go out of sight or he just behind that limb. We were always sure he was just out of sight because we knew he heard us and we knew he would eat the food that we left for him. And so every day we would always go out and the neighborhood kids would come with us. We'd all go out and feed Pepe and search for Pepe. And every day we thought he was a little closer and a little bit more trusting of us. And then one day we go back and we find his desiccated little body under the foot of an oak tree. So we take him and we dress him in the cap and cape that we made him that might have been his, that life been kinder, and we put him in the box he was shipped in. And we take our wagon and we drape it with black crepe paper and we put on our parents' big black clothes, we roll up the cuffs and roll up the sleeves, and we have a huge funeral procession of my the street where my parents lived, and all the kids follow the coffin up because everybody is so saddened by the death of our friend. And we, we have a gravestone made of paper mache which says, R.I.P. Pepe, our friend. And it's in the back of the house. My father's dug a hole, and he's back there with a shovel going, oh, put the damn thing in, I want to go golfing. But we are so saddened by this. And we put him in the hole, and we cover him up, and we're not out of sight before the dog next door digs him up for monkey jerky and runs off with his body. And we never see him again. 